Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Fun Friday with a very special guest, a big get, a rising star in the business. I don't know if rising is really the, the if it's fair to say, because you're not a rookie anymore, but you've accomplished an incredible amount in a very short period of time. The founder and principal of Starting Point Capital, the one and only Jeremy Dyer. How are you today, my friend? Craig, I really appreciate it. Appreciate the introduction. And I also probably wouldn't refer to myself as being necessarily the rising star, but I have self-proclaimed, you heard it here first on the show, the self-proclaimed rookie of the year. I have to give you your flowers on that one and also echo that. I think the numbers speak for itself and we're going to dive into those numbers in fact. But before we get into it, tell us about yourself. And, and what I really want to say uh, before we jump into that is you're the epitome of someone who is a high performing individual in the sales world who kind of turned his you know, network into, you know, and probably passion of investing into a business and a career path in the second career, right? So we're going to deep dive into that. But if I'm not mistaken, you've been, you know, the number one sales guy and rep at ADP for a very long period of time now. So kind of give us your origin story, kind of your background and how you got to this point today, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I'd be, be happy to. So, I mean, my really, really my sales journey started when, at a very young age. You know, I was that guy that would go to the local convenience store, uh, pick up some some bubble gum you know, for 25 cents, you know, sell each piece for a quarter, sell the whole pack, you know, five for a dollar, you know, give the customer a good deal kind of a thing. You know, Christmas time, I was the guy going door to door selling, you know, Christmas trees and candy bars and really anything I could do to make a buck, right? You know, I had all kinds of side hustles when I was growing up, anything from lawn and landscape jobs to, you know, again, you know, hustling uh, candy bar and wrapping paper door to door, right? So that's really, really a part of my my DNA is really in sales. And my goal once I got into school was to get through it as fast as I possibly could, because I just knew I had to get that paper, I had to get that certificate, and I really just wanted to, quite frankly, move on with the rest of my life. So, you know, I went to college, got a degree in marketing, because that was about the closest thing that I could get, you know, to a sales degree, you know, so to speak. Right. Um, land yeah, landed my first job right out of college. Uh, I'm actually with the exact same employer that I have been with. Uh, literally since day one, once I exited college, I've been there for almost 23 year, years now as of May. And uh, I was very blessed early on. Um, you know, had I would argue that I had a great attitude about me. I put in a lot of activity. It was obviously a daily grind. And uh, that very first year, um, I was fortunate enough to become, you know, that rookie of the year, you know, year number one, you know, year number two, and I'd, I'd catapulted to the to the number one guy you know, in the United States. And by year three, I was the number one guy in North America. So, you know, really largely crushing it, you know, in my day job, which obviously gave me and my wife the ability to have some extra capital on the sidelines to get involved in real estate. Absolutely. So it sounds like you use real estate as a vehicle to create, you know, wealth outside of your current income stream, which was, you know, your you know, more corporate level, executive level status there. And then you kind of use this angle as your nest egg, as kind of maybe a way out in the future, should you want to pursue other endeavors in the future? Would you say that's kind of a fair representation of where, you know, your excess capital went with regards to investing and such? Yeah, oh, ab absolutely, 100%. I mean, you know, having enough excess cash on the sidelines and having made some smart investment decisions, you know, over the years into investments that produce consistent, you know, cash flow with benefits, Right. Um, has enabled me to be in a position out today, you know, where I'm able to really kind of play in both sandboxes, so to speak, right? You know, I'm able to still crush it, you know, in my in my day job, you know, year over year, and I'm also able to build up a, a business on the side. Um, but you know, again, that didn't start. I didn't get there overnight, right? You know, that largely is a direct byproduct of the fact that I was willing to put in the the reps, you know, early in my career. You know, I was willing to spend the extra time on the front end, you know, to continue to build those relationships with prospects and clients and people internally. And uh, again, I was just blessed to be able to be in a position at a very young age, uh, believe it or not, at the age of 24 years of age, um, I, my wife and I had purchased literally our dream home. We had a couple of kiddos at the time, you know, wow. had the 
Yeah. I had the 40 foot RV sit in the driveway. You know, I mean, I was completely debt free at the young age of 24, but I was not able to do that, you know, or I would not have been able to do that, you know, had I not really, you know, grinded out my sales career, you know, those first, you know, few years come out of college. Absolutely. And, you know, we'll kind of dive into the sales side of, of the world and how that's very complementary to, of course, your uh, ancillary career of, you know, capital raising, which you do at an incredible clip, uh, as you as we both agree, uh, the rookie of the year in that as well. But let's dive into your first real estate investment. Was it in fact your primary residence? And then after that, if it wasn't your primary residence, how did you maybe learn about syndication, you know, money, uh, you know, pooling there and, you know, kind of buying deals that are maybe potentially outside of the norm. What did you buy a duplex? So maybe tell us about your first investment, if it was your house and then maybe uh, the next one after that too. Yeah, absolutely. Be more than happy to do that. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you where my investing journey really began okay. and, it's, and it is in college. So in college, I bit the bug of becoming a day trader. Okay. okay. So when I was in college, it was during the dot-com explosion and then the bubble burst. Okay. Yeah. So is that like late nineties, early thousands <laughs> for those who are not maybe educated for younger, because that was like the Clinton, I think kind of time period around then maybe George Bush was getting into office just for, uh, I think retro or for, for perspective for, you know, the, the days that was. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. So it was kind of that, you know, years 1998, you know, through kind of 2000, uh, you know, 2001 really, uh, which were the years that I was in college, you know, back in those days, we didn't have smartphones and, you know, fancy technologies. So, you know, I'd sit down at a computer, you know, on campus and, you know, dial up the internet through a modem. Right. <laughs> um, but it was, it was also in those days that internet trading became capable for everyday people. You know, you didn't have to contact, you know, a financial advisor or somebody else to, to trade stocks on your behalf. And so I, I got bit by that bug and I did really well. I mean, to the point in which, you know, I was making some, some good money as a college student, you know, essentially day trading stocks. Um, the problem was, is the bubble burst, you know, in early uh, 2000 and I started losing a considerable amount of the gains. Well, the other challenge was, is I was using my college tuition to trade stocks and I was trading those stocks on margin. So as, oh. <laughs> so as the market started to, you know, quote unquote, correct or come down, you know, it just meant that my, my losses were amplified. So that really is kind of one of my very early, you know, on experiences in investing. And any questions on that? If not, I'm going to dive into how then the real estate investing started. Well, yeah, I'd be curious to know kind of how that landscape was, because I don't think we've mentioned this in the show, and it's, it's fascinating to me as my dad's been a long-term financial advisor, but that must have really felt like the wild, wild west and pretty primitive for what it was in its time. I mean, I think it's such commonplace now where many people, if not everyone, has got some sort of E-Trade, Robinhood account of sorts, where they can kind of put their equity in there and trade, you know, at will, maybe put money into S&P 500, you know, buy cryptocurrency now on those platforms. So it's certainly more mainstream now, but did you kind of feel like it was a new sector, if you will, and you know something totally different at that time. Did people think kind of, you were kind of crazy and you know not really the most traditional in many respects? Because obviously now you're raising money for alts, so you've seemingly always had this mindset of going against the grain and kind of carving your own path. So be curious to know what perception was from your family, friends, peers, things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot to unpack there, but at the end of the day, I'll just kind of summarize it like this, and that is, you know, it always felt odd to me that people were willing to invest their hard earned money into something that, or a company that doesn't actually generate a profit. Second to that, it always seemed uncharacteristic to me or um, really more abnormal for stock prices to react to negative news in a positive way and for stock prices to react in a positive way, you know, with negative news, right? Like there wasn't really any correlation there, you know, and that's really in large part why, you know, one of the main drivers for me to get, you know, more diversified into hard assets and, and pivot into real estate was because I could never quite figure out the, the, the Wall Street algorithms, you know, so to speak, and how to actually monetize, you know, investing in Wall Street. And I know that there's people out there that have, you know, programs and they've kind of figured it out, 
but it was something that ne never really made sense to me. Whereas investing in real estate made sense because I could either directly control the outcome of that asset as an active investor, or, you know, as a passive investor, you know, I know the lead sponsor and I can give the lead sponsor a call. I can call the team that's actually, you know, managing the value add business plan. And so it was a lot more realistic to me, you know, than, than Wall Street investing was. Absolutely. And I think something to think about as well for, for the audience listening and for folks to kind of conceptualize the beauty of syndication in many respects is you're usually typically speaking, partnering with operators who are local experts and local experts have local insights, local insights and inside information or local insights kind of have insider information. So you're kind of hacking the system, if you will, with unique nuances that, you know, frankly, might be illegal if you're kind of trading in the public markets like equities, you know, stock bonds, things of that nature. So, you know, we want to handicap the game into our favor as much as possible. And I think that's the beauty of what we do. You know, we have information within Houston, Dallas and San Antonio that the average person just cannot navigate, which makes us the expert, which gives us an unfair advantage to land outsized returns, which you obviously have done very well at identifying key players there. So transitioning from the stocks and bond world, did you kind of fizzle out from there? Where did the journey take you after that kind of segment? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So really my first real estate acquisition was the the house that we live in. One of the biggest mistakes we made there is not building it big enough because at the time, you know, we were our plan was to have two kids. We'll fast forward, you know, a dozen years after we built that home, we we now have four kids, right? And, and a dog and all the animals and stuff like that. So, you know, we've we'd have we've obviously had to to add on a couple of times since then, but you know, the other uh, thing that I would say that I made a mistake in, and that is we paid off our mortgage, you know, right away, right? You know, it, you know, at a, at a, at a three and a quarter percent, you know, interest rate, you know, back in the early, you know, two thousands. Right. Um, I wish in hindsight that I had instead invested that capital, you know, into passive real estate investments, but lesson learned there. So now we get into uh, 2015 and my wife and I are watching an HGTV station right before bed about fixing and flipping homes. It seemed super sexy, you know, at the time in terms of the outsized returns, you know, the actors or actresses were getting, you know, flipping these houses and right. we, and we had some extra capital sitting on the sidelines. So we decided to start acquiring single family homes. Um, it just so happened to be that my dad uh, at the time was a licensed general contractor. You know, my wife was not working a W-2 job outside of taking care of our, of our kids at home. She had a knack for interior design. So perfect. Uh, match made in heaven, right? So we started writing checks uh, and, and, and buying some single family distressed uh, houses. Um, and we were beating out a lot of other uh, flippers in the space because we were coming in with no contingencies. Uh, we were coming in with cash on the table with no debt. And so we were able to really wrestle our way into a number of different opportunities. And that business was, was going well. Okay. The challenge came and that is around the 2016, 2017 period, my wife and I decided to double down on kids. So we went from two kids to four kids you know, I was still grinding it out in my W-2 job. We were trying to build up an active real estate, you know, portfolio of single family fix and flips or rental properties. And it just got to the point where we had to make a decision. Okay. The decision is, does Jeremy quit his W-2 job and only do active fix and flips and rentals, which I could certainly have done. The challenge is we were going to have to go from, you know, flipping a couple of houses a year to 20 to 30, right? You know, right. almost overnight to replace that, that active income. The second side of that story was, is that my two older boys were active in year round sports. And I told my wife, you know, as much as I would love to be able to manage two full-time jobs, one of these has to give because I don't want to look at you or my children in 20 years from now and say, where did the years go, right? I wanted to spend time, you know, with my boys, you know, my two adopted children uh, that we had adopted, you know, around that same time as well. And obviously spend time, you know, uh, dating my wife, you know, on the, on the weekend, so to speak. Yeah. And you, you, you're like many people there, they do it themselves. They get into the single family space, which is the most palatable, you know, entry space to get into. It makes sense. It's very streamlined. It's very, you know, down the fairway, if you will, with regards to the concept and plan. You know, you have, you know, somewhere between a 25 to 35% ARV, you know, after repair value spread in there, that'll cover your cost, the fees associated with the transaction, and then on to the next, right? So out of curiosity, 
Do you still own any of those assets? Were those in and out plays? Do you have any long-term holds outside of syndications for some kind of cash flow locally in the market that you live in currently? Or have you kind of parted ways from those opportunities and put them into kind of third-party operations like what we do and some of your other partners? Yeah, that's a great question. So we largely pivoted completely away from single family home ownership. Um, I do own a couple of assets like a boat slip and we rent out our RV, um, you know, throughout the season, that sort of thing, you know, but outside of those, which are fairly, you know, not that time consuming, we've largely deployed all of that initial capital at this point, as well as continue, you know, to deploy new, you know, dry powder, you know, into new uh, real estate investment opportunities, primarily, you know, as limited partners. And my story really in the limited partner passive space started in about 2015, where I had made my first um, investment into a property where I knew, liked, and trusted the sponsor. Um, and that was the first deal as a limited partner. And I will be honest, I used the shotgun approach initially. Okay. Um, if you had asked me in 2015 what the word syndication meant, I would have told you, I'm not sure, other than I know the Green Bay Packers are a syndicated football team. Now, <laughs> beyond that, that was my extent in terms of my knowledge of what syndication is. So I really, you know, again, used the shotgun approach. I held my breath, I plugged my nose, I sent that wire transfer into the sponsor, and I did not make any new investments again until 2019. I waited four years to make investment number two. And the genesis behind that is because I wanted the theory to prove itself out. And it did. That's awesome. So let's get into that now. Syndication. So you have a single family background, you started day trading, then you go to flips, more in your control, then syndication. Where was that deal? How did you hear about it? And then did you catch the bug after? Um, and then also from that point, when did you kind of learn that capital raising was an occupation and was a opportunity for you to really grow your wealth and, you know, tap into your network? Yeah, that first investment opportunity was in was in Minnesota. And again, you know, 2019 rolls around, you know, I get my initial capital back, you know, it produces an over 2x equity multiple. You know, again, I'm I'm kind of hooked now. Now it's like Of course. Now now it's like, all right, so if that investment sponsor is not doing a deal, I got to find some that are, right? So I really did a lot of network workings from 2019 until 2021, getting to know all the exceptional best in class, you know, sponsors in the syndication space. Uh, I largely used LinkedIn for that. I signed up for, you know, probably a hundred different sponsors, you know, newsletters so that I could get on their newsletter list. They could educate me through email. I listened to them on podcasts if they make appearances on those or if they happen to host their own. You know, during that kind of 2019 to 2021 period, I probably looked at a hundred different pitch decks, right? Um, if not more, you know, each year, really, right? So every week it was like one or two new opportunities would hit my inbox, you know, and I would listen to the investor presentation. More than anything, I chose not to invest in every single one of those deals, obviously. But the reason why I did it was for learning and education purposes, because now now the bug was bit. So every time I was going for a jog, every time I was sitting on the, you know, on the rowing machine, I was listening to pitch decks from sponsors. I was listening to podcasts. I was reading books, right? I just wanted to immerse myself in the business so that I could get to know everything that I could about real estate investing as a limited partner. But the purpose of doing it at that time was not to educate other people about those benefits. It was just merely to educate myself. It was very self-serving, right? Because now I was bit by the bug. I had some more capital to deploy. And in my mind, real estate investing was going to be my diversification play you know, outside of Wall Street. Not saying that I wasn't going to still play in Wall Street, but it just simply meant that my goal at that time was really to reallocate my overall percentage of net worth, you know, into real estate about 50, 50. That's awesome. So yeah, that's really impressive. And I, and I think you might be one of the only people in America that has hit the ergo meter while listening to a real estate syndication podcast, if I'm hearing that correctly. So good for you for doing that and grinding it out. And it seems like naturally being a competitive person, you probably played sports a lot growing up 
and then grow, going into sales, you're competitive. So you seem like a sponge, someone who, you know, figures something out and can't drop it and needs to know everything about it, which, you know, being curious, I think is the gateway to success. And clearly you have that, you have that kind of brain and skill set, the producer mindset that enables you to have that, follow your passions, follow your pursuits and then execute and, and monetize it, which is so special, which is obviously, you know, why you probably became such a quick uh, study with regards to, you know, crushing in the corporate world and then also um, into the capital raising space as well. Uh, with addition to that, you you learned about that in 2019. At that point, you you know want to get more diversified. Then did the floodgates open with opportunities? You know, where were you investing? And how did you kind of go about the vetting process with sponsors? Yeah, yeah, all all great questions. So in 2019, obviously I doubled down on the effort. I think in 2019 I had invested in six additional deals, most of which were in the Tennessee market, all primarily with one, you know, lead sponsor that, you know, had boots on the ground in that particular market, right? You know, then 2020, everybody kind of takes a pause, right? Nobody knows what's going to happen. I think yeah. I did one or two deals in uh, in in 2020. Um I think those deals were in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Um, and maybe Nashville, Tennessee. So then 2021 rolls around and people are kind of getting back at it again. You know, 2021, I think I invested in another six or seven deals, but at that same point in time, I was also starting to educate others. Okay. Strictly because a lot of my, in a lot of people in my personal and professional network were just more, more curious than anything. You know, I would, it was kind of like that, you know, I'll call it a shiny new object, right? It was like something that I was excited about, something I was passionate about. And when you get to that point, you just kind of want to genuinely tell other people about what you're up to. So 2021 was really largely my year, at least as it relates to the capital raising space, it was my year to work for free. Okay. What I mean by that is it was my year to tee up opportunities to people that are in my personal and professional network to invest in other sponsors deals that I have personally invested my own money into in the past, right? You know, and, and felt comfortable enough to recommend or refer people in my own network to invest in their deals as well. That makes sense. So were you doing basically referrals and whatnot? And obviously, you know, everyone likes to talk about hitting a nice game. Everyone wants to talk about you know, if they bought a sweet deal or had a six stock play, something of that nature, right? We, we all talk about it. If we're playing golf, we're bragging with our friends. And, you know, when you shoot the breeze, it comes up naturally, right? Did you kind of start organically referring people? And then you kind of realize, oh, wait, there's actually a career in this. Did you know that there was kind of a place in the capital stack for, you know, boutique? And I can't even call you boutique anymore because boutiques, you know, slightly <laughs> different. But, you know, did you realize that there was a way for you to make a lot of money there? Or did it kind of, did any sponsor realize like, hey, you can get paid for this, you know, and here's how, what was that like? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, at the time I really didn't know that there was a way to monetize it, right? And quite frankly, I was also in a position where I didn't need the money, okay? However, what ended up happening is as I started to continue to refer more and more investors, I started seeing this snowball effect. Okay. So not only were referred investors investing in those sponsors deals and obviously just simply giving me a thank you for it, but their own personal professional network was also choosing to invest into those sponsors opportunities. So one of the sponsors that I've worked with for a number of years came to me and said, Jeremy, you know, you're pretty good at this. You know, we use you as a reference when investors ask us for an investor reference and you've been referring a bunch of people to us. And did you know that there's a way to monetize this, right? You know, through maybe, you know, a co-GP share model or a fund of funds model. And so at the time I said, you know, thanks, but no thanks, right? But then another year goes by. So now we're into 2022. We're almost current here. We're into 2022 and the investment sponsor that again, I've got a very close relationship with tells me, Jeremy, you need to monetize this kind of a thing. Like it would be a no brainer, right? Do you have any extra bandwidth in your life to be able to, you know, form a business, you know, come up with a name, form a business you know, you know enough about the business at this point, by the way, in 2022, you know, I was an LP investor in 17 or 18 deals at that point, 
you know, with a half a dozen sponsors in 12 different markets, right? So I knew enough, you know, about how to stress test the financials and the modeling and, you know, find and identify, you know, best in class sponsors, et cetera. So it was really in 2022 that I was, you know, given my first opportunity, you know, to go to bat, right? In the space where now I've got a company, I've got a logo, you know, I've got a website, right? And I've got branding. A, I've got branding. I've got a list of, you know, potential investors. Uh, and also leading up to that, I spent six months putting myself out there on social media so that when it came time to actually pull the trigger on an opportunity to bring it to my investor network, that pump was already primed, right? You know, I started having those types of discussions, you know, through LinkedIn, really more than anything, it wasn't to educate people per se. It wasn't to encourage people to invest in passive real estate opportunities. It was really just for me to tell my story, right? So I used LinkedIn as a way to really tell people about myself, you know, what I was doing, you know, humanize the effort so that when I had that first opportunity in 2022 to bring an opportunity to my own personal and professional network, you know, the, the pump had already been primed, so to speak. And thankfully that first deal went great. I raised seven figures in less than one day. This is my first deal. Okay. The deal, however, filled up in 26 hours from the time we launched it. So the sponsor said, Jeremy, you got to shut the spigot off. We can't take any more capital. Okay. This is 2022, right? And so at that time, I didn't necessarily understand how all of that worked, but they said, Jeremy, you're done. Right. So that was really my first opportunity. My first at bat was in, in 2022. That's amazing. And do you feel comfortable sharing the sponsor? I know who it is, but if you want to say the name, more than happy, we can give them a free out of here. You may not know the name of the sponsor uh, because it might not be the one that you're thinking about. Okay. But the sponsor is Endurus Capital and the lead okay. sponsor is Todd Dexheimer, uh, Drew Whitson, and Matt Bronner. Very cool. Yeah. I was thinking it was going to be Zach with Rise, who, by the way, is going to be coming on uh, our podcast as well. In BEC, we're going to do a joint episode of Bikram and Zach. So that'll be super fun. You know, we're all in the business this together. And we obviously share so many, you know, capital partners like yourself. So why not become friends and enrich our relationships? But that's super cool to hear that that person was so generous and honestly, such a friend and a partner to, you know, really empower you to do that. And I think that's such a beautiful place and space regarding our business is it's such a collaborative industry where everyone can win. And let me break that down for everyone real quick. The title people who do the title and escrow stuff can get paid. The lender can get paid. The lenders, investors can get paid off the note um, on you know all sides of the transaction. The seller can make money off their business plan. And then finally, the new buyer can come in and also have and gains for their investors. So there's very few places, places where it's zero or very few businesses where it's like real estate, where it's not a zero sum game business where everyone can get where they need to go accordingly and, and play. So I really do love the fact that real estate is so collaborative and cohesive in that regard and just shows just how special there it is. And there's so much of a pie to share, but you know, you said something as well, which is super uh, crucial for the people who are listening that are looking to get in the capital raising space, which is the best time to raise capital is well before you actually need to raise capital. And it's getting the well dug before you're thirsty. And you've clearly done that. And you also put your money where your mouth is. You know, you have your own personal skin in the game, which is, you know, very crucial. And I think people really respect and appreciate that. That's typically speaking, when we work with new people, one of the biggest questions that they need to get comfortable with is, you know, to what degree or extent that we are investing in the deal. So it's super sweet that you've done that. And, you know, you also went through the painstaking process of sourcing these relationships, finding these sponsors, having a track record with them, going full cycle likely before you got other people involved with that. That's very uh, admirable that you've done that and went through it and, you know, now can sip, sip the Kool-Aid and give other people the Kool-Aid and the gospel with regards to the space that we're in, which is super unique. So with that said, you know, I, I think another you know lesson that people can learn from you is, you know, how, you know, what you do is kind of how you do a lot of things and your brand. And clearly people probably felt very comfortable with working with you because you're a pro's pro. You are, you know, the leader in your own space and now you're becoming a leader in this space. So, you know, you're kind of always on an audition one way or another in life. Everything you've done, you know, will come back one way or another. And I think it's really powerful just that, you know, you were able to convert a lot of these people who were probably colleagues and peers into clients now, right? So 
do you think there's a, a, a lot of successful overlap and kind of your name and reputation was built upon the legacy that you've created at your corporate job to, um, you know, capital raising now? Do you, do you see those things kind of intertwining correctly? Yeah, I, I call those the transferable skills, right? Uh, which you've obviously heard that before. And I would wholeheartedly believe that most people that try to get into the space of capital raising, or maybe those that are trying to take their, you know, game to the next level, you know, they'll oftentimes ask me, Jeremy, you know, you've really been at this for 16, maybe 17 months, right? Um, and you have raised tens of millions from hundreds of investors while maintaining a full-time day job, W2 job, while, you know, being a full-time you know, hockey coach on three teams, you know, and being a full-time, you know, father and husband, like how on earth do you do that? And let me make another <laughs> caveat as well. I'm looking, I have a pretty good camera and we just connected in Phoenix the other day. I don't see big bags under your eyes. I don't see gray <laughs> hair and I don't see wrinkles. I don't see any signs of unhealth and you're in great shape. You're a full-time present dad, a husband, all these things. So time management is obviously something you've clearly cracked and figured out. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I say it's probably the the running and the water um, obviously go to to help uh, with uh, maintaining my youth and maybe the coffee too. So we'll see. Yeah, coffee's for closers. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> That's yeah. right. So really at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I try to explain this to people that are getting in the space. You, you'll have a little bit, bit of success if you grind it out, okay? Um, meaning you put in the activity, you have the attitude, right? And you're consistent with it. Like we're all going to have success if we just do those things. Okay. But the reason why I have a competitive advantage over most is because of my reputation. Okay. It's because of the massive network of people, you know, that I have gotten to know over the years, you know, both personally and professionally, I have a competitive advantage over others. The reality is most of the people that have invested, you know, through me into, you know, other sponsors opportunities, right? Through Starting Point Capital, a lot of these people are people that have known me for two decades or longer, right? They know my reputation, they know my track record, you know, they're willing to invest not in the sponsor's deal, they're willing to invest in Jeremy because if Jeremy's vetted out the opportunity and Jeremy's willing to put his own hard earned six figures into that deal, then I'm in too, right? So yeah. really, really that's kind of the genesis of why I am where I am today is because I've not ever burned bridges over the course of my life. You know, I, I, I've, I'm constantly trying to find ways to become a better version of myself, to level up my networking game. Like it really all comes down to those types of things. And the next thing is, is I just have to be consistent in my behavior and my consistent in my, in my actions. Without a doubt. And I, I think you, you hit on something I want to kind of expand on real quick, which is your network and doing things that led up to allowing your sex success today. I do oftentimes see a lot of people who want to raise capital and it's really awesome. They've identified how amazing the space is. The problem is there's not sometimes the most life experience with a lot of people who want to raise capital, which is totally fine. We need to start somewhere, but you know, it's going to be hard for someone who's not, you know, a top for, you know, earner top, you know, salesperson without, you know, the other ancillary background to really kind of come in and hit the ground running consistently. So you know, being excellent in one space and then adding on the capital raising side is great. But if you're just graduating college or, you know, you're a couple of years out, you're really looking at an uphill battle here. You know, I really think it's important to either, you know, kind of partner with the sponsor or, you know, be on the sponsor side, like someone like myself, where, you know, I look at it, I could have raised capital independently, but not consistently and not to the clip I'd like to, as opposed to me going from the residential space, which you talk about complementary skills, you know, going from real estate A to real estate B you know, different sectors, but, you know, they rhyme in some senses, right? It's kind of like, hey, if residential real estate is Spanish, you know, call it uh, capital raising commercial real estate is, you know, let's say uh, Italian, right? They're both Latin-based languages. They sound similar enough, but they're nuanced and different, right? So it's important to have, you know, that background, I think, to really succeed and thrive over consistently because, you know, it's not uncommon to see someone kind of hit the ground running and raise a million dollars one time and get lucky, but, you know, those who are great like yourself and, you know, a lot of the partners we get to work with are those who do it again, 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 answer the bell, answer the call and do it consistently. So I think 
for just some life advice generally, build up the network first before you really want to start capital raising and also invest in these deals and get a feel for the business. Don't just, you know, stay, hey, I'm going to raise capital. It's like, from who? You know, so I always find that to be slightly silly, not to discourage anyone from getting in the space, of course, follow your dreams, but just realize, you know, if you want to eventually do it, it's so awesome. You've found it early, but know that it's going to come with struggles if you actually haven't built a, a legitimate bona fide high net worth network. Yeah, absolutely. So it's definitely a long game. And I would, I would maybe add a couple of things or maybe just add on to Please. what you, you said. Yeah. What you said, Craig, you know, really for me also, let's be honest, my avatar is highly compensated salespeople. It just is right. Yeah. Well, it's not, who you are too. It's true to your core. You're not, you're not faking it. You're not, you're not, you're not, oh yeah. I'm this random person coming in, trying to, you know, sell to doctors or lawyers. It's like, or athletes. It's like, well, who are you? Like be what you are. Yeah, absolutely. And then the other side of it is, is, you know, really, if we talk about the alignment of interest, you know, I can tell investors, you know, that I'm currently a limited partner and now 29 deals, right? Multiple seven figures of my own invested capital, you know, into these opportunities collectively across the, the spectrum of the portfolio, right? And every opportunity that I bring to investors, you know, I'm going to put on average 100K of my own money into these deals, right? Which oftentimes puts me, you know, either at the top or close to the top in terms of the largest limited partner investor, you know, coming through, you know, that fund of funds model. And then the last thing that I would tell you is I think sometimes in this, you know, world of raising capital, um, sometimes people start to chase the capital, right? They get desperate for the capital. And when you start to chase capital or get desperate for capital, it gets scared, right? It, it runs, runs away. It's yeah. repellent. We talked about this. I remember when we were in person, funny enough, and it's such a smart concept. And I'd really love for you to uh, expand on this thought and kind of your strategy there, if you don't mind unveiling a bit of the curtain. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, really at the end of the day, I like to think of myself as a capital magnet, right? Um, where capital just genuinely wants to find its way to me, right? And I do that by putting myself out there on, on social media and trying to, to educate, serve, 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 give, 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 right? And the more that I find myself serving others and giving back to others, right? And educating, you know, them largely, you know, on the space or connecting, you know, with them, right? Versus trying to only engage with investors when I have a deal that I'm trying to fill up, right? Um, I found that to be the best way where capital then just genuinely wants to find its way, you know, into your deal, so to speak. And so I agree with you 100%, you know, that, you know, we, we ought not to, you know, get desperate and to chase after capital, but really in this business, we need to focus on the long game, which the long game oftentimes means spending more time providing value and building relationships with others so that that deal that you decide to do in 12 months from now has enough capital on the sidelines ready to deploy versus the one that you're trying to, you know, hit your target today. Absolutely. No, that's really well said. And attracting is super important. And that's, you know, to your degree, as you said, hey, well, sales is a mindset. Marketing is more of a skill, I would say. So if you can figure out how to market, then throwing on a sales skill set is really important. And I was just having a conversation earlier today. And there's you know, something I really think about in the beauty of working with Lone Star Capital and you know, partnering with best in class operators is it's really not selling to a certain extent. It's really qualifying. It's being a good listener. It's being active with note taking. It's figuring out what your customer or clients wants, needs are for capital raisers. Is that addressing the pain points, figuring out why they would invest with you and, you know, figuring out if they're even a good fit because you don't want everyone's dollars in a deal. You don't want to raise money from everyone. So really uh, listening to people, being proactive about it, being there, being consistent, showing up and just taking care of people. It's amazing how uh, much gratitude people have for that to be heard. And, you know, the, the most important thing is just to, to be good to people and figure out that you're actually solving for the need. Because if you're just taking at the end of the day, that's not a good relationship that's long term. You know, there's been situations where I've spoke with people where I actually identify what their goals are and actually direct them to a different investing platform or just say, hey, you know what, we're probably not the best fit for XYZ reason. But when things change, we'd love to be first in line there. And they're really taken back, but also really appreciative of my transparency and honesty, realizing that 
hey, we you know we're not trying to make a dollar today. We're trying to make a million tomorrow, so to speak, right? So really having that, you know, intention of serving, as you mentioned, is really special. So thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, the the paradigm switch of attracting versus chasing, right? So that that's really great there. As far as kind of types of deals you raise for, what do you typically do? I know, obviously, we're multifamily sponsors. We're having the pleasure of partnering on multiple deals together and look forward to a long lasting and fruitful relationship that will last hopefully many decades. But what do you typically do? Multifamily, what else? Do you ever do self storage, office maybe if you're crazy, retail? What what do you typically like to, to do outside of multifamily, if anything? Yeah, it's great. So on, on the LP side, I'm I'm invested in assisted living, uh, self storage, retail, flex office, industrial. Um, so there's a number of different, you know, other asset classes that I put my own personal money into. And I'm not opposed to also looking at those types of opportunities for our investors in the future. However, at this point, the majority of our investors are brand new to the space, meaning the most of our investors that we bring into opportunities have only been limited partner investors in at least one or two deals within the last you know year and a half, right? And so I have felt personally as well as professionally speaking, that the best types of investments to get started with, if you've not personally done a private placement investment in the past, is really in the multifamily space. And with respect to the multifamily space, specifically that you know traditional value add space, why the value add and not the build the rent, for example, or maybe more of a longer term investment is because I like to have investors that are brand new that get started for the first time, I like to see them see some success early on in that investment, right? From some of the cash flow distributions that they receive, you know, right away, you know, month number one of the investment, right? I like to see them immediately be impacted as a, as a direct result of the passive depreciation loss activity that's reported on their K1, right? I'm not necessarily opposed to the build the rent space. The challenge with that space is usually those types of investments don't start cash flowing for at least 24 months, sometimes longer. And there's oftentimes not a depreciation you know, benefit to the investor year one because you can't depreciate dirt, right? So I really like the multifamily value add space. I really personally like kind of that workforce, you know, housing demographic where the majority of the population lives. Typically, we're not having to worry about things like, you know, occupancy, right? You know, it's more of a, you know, how can the sponsor, you know, bring some value, you know, to this property, you know, decrease the deferred maintenance, burn off the loss to lease, right? And and really, you know, ramp that property up and look to ultimately, you know, sell that asset in maybe three to five years from when the investor makes that original capital contribution. Absolutely. Well, well said there. And, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, well, not it's a, it's a it's a touchy subject, but I'll say this: we all see what's going on south of the border as well right now with immigration or illegal immigration, however you want to phrase it, call it. You know, it's up to you. But we're seeing that going on in real time right now. And guess where those people need to live? The answer is somewhere, and that's why we're in Texas. That's why you know not only do we get natural, you know, legal, you know, in, in net in country migration, but all those folks they're not living in mansions. You know, unfortunately, not at least not to my knowledge. Uh, maybe they're living in hotels with credit cards in New York, uh, but by and large, they need to live in apartment complexes and they're going to likely stay more often than not in Texas or, you know, more Latin speaking, you know, or Spanish speaking uh, states like Arizona, of course, New Mexico, uh, likely Florida and Texas. That's in my guess where most people are going to stick, which is where we're going to be. You mentioned alluded to workforce housing. That's specifically what we're looking to buy as well, too. And I think the strategy there is, listen, you can't replace that, you know, uh, housing profile and type um, for anything that's relatively economically affordable. So, you know, when we're buying so below uh, replacement costs, it's really, really crucial. You know, it's suburban areas. You know, it's really a great strategy uh, and hedge with everything going on right now. So we look at the world there similarly as well. Uh, what are some of the key metrics um, and things that you look for when you're uh, making a real estate investment? You know, some things that get you excited and nervous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it really obviously comes really down to the sponsor. And what I like to explain to investors is, you know, since I've really been in the business of investing 
in syndications as a limited partner investor since 2015. There's really six different things that I evaluate. Um, and I've really broken those six different things down into my six T's for investing. Okay. In no particular order, you know, one big one is trust, right? You know, do you trust the investment sponsors ability to produce or exceed the projected returns, right? So it's really that element of trust. Okay. But when it comes to trust, there's a lot of people in my life that I trust, but not a lot of them that I would trust with a hundred thousand dollars of my money to renovate a 250 unit apartment building. Okay. So, so there's, there's that side of the, the trust factor, right? The other one is really transparency, right? You know, because I always invest in sponsors deals before I ever bring one of their future deals to my investors, I am able to assess, you know, over months and sometimes even years, their transparency with their investors, right? You know, because the one thing that we know in real estate is that it doesn't always go according to plan, okay? We know that full well with the historic rise in, in interest rates over the course of the last 18 months, right? No doubt. We, we, we know that things like COVID are going to happen. You know, heaven forbid, hopefully it never happens again, but, you know, wars, right? Those types of things happen, right? Uh, global financial crises, they happen, right? Those types of things happen. So is the sponsor being transparent month to month with their investors as to how things are actually going relative to the boots that are on the ground in that particular property? The third one's really the track record, right? Um, I really like to align myself with sponsors like Lone Star Capital that have a proven track record. You've got some deals that have gone full cycle. You've got some deals uh, that are active, they're going well, according to plan, right? You know, that track record can sometimes give a, a pretty good indication, you know, as to how future investment acquisitions are going to go for that team. Obviously, number four is timing. That's a difficult one, right? Because if you talk to an, to an investor in real estate in 2017, they would have all told you a recession's on the horizon. Well, yeah. no recession really happened quite yet. Now we're fast forward to 2024. If you chose not to make an investment in 2017, it was a bad decision, right? Relative to the sponsor, their track record, the asset itself, those types of things, the performance of the asset, right? But I firmly believe from a timing perspective that there are opportunities to invest into real estate at all different stages of the market cycle relative to that local area, right? And that's why I'm a big fan of diversification, right? I encourage investors to diversify into multiple different investments over time versus sticking all of their eggs in one basket, so to speak. You know, number five is really the territory. There's one thing in real estate that you can't do and you can't move a 250 unit apartment building to a different market location, right? So that market location and that territory that that asset is located is incredibly important. You guys know that all too well, you know, as it relates to job growth and wage growth and crime and et cetera, et cetera, right? And really the final thing is the team. There are teams in this business that are teams of one, five, 10, and 300, right? At the end of the day, is that operator vertically integrated in property management, building construction, you know, who are the people that that team is surrounded with? So what you might have a great relationship with one of the lead sponsors or one of the investor relations people on that team. That's only one person. That one person is not going to be ultimately responsible for producing uh, the projected returns that that investment sponsor projected in their pitch deck, right? It's really the collective effort of the entire team that's going to, you know, oversee that investment. And really that comes down to the asset management piece. That's awesome. Now it was, I mean, I, we we're going to definitely be clipping that for LinkedIn. Um, and that's an amazing nugget you just dropped on everyone. And hopefully uh, they can reach out to you and we'll, we'll give uh, references if people want to invest with you, learn more about that, but implement that into their kind of strategy. That was Really well said and well stated. Thank you so much for dropping that here. And, you know, it comes to team, you're absolutely right. You know, I don't know really the interworkings of the acquisition side uh, to the full extent. All I do is, you know, make sure that people like yourself 
are aware of what's going on. I'll study and learn the deal after, but I also don't do the asset management or property management, but it's so crucial to have that. And, you know, one person is not control at all. And, you know, having a small shop can be nice, but also there's some downsides to it. So really consider who you're working with, you know, who plays what role it ultimately is a team sport, you know, just like football, you know, maybe the ultimate team sport, you know, the quarterback's one position, but the lineman got a block and then the defense got to hold up their end of the bargain and make sure that, you know, the team doesn't score, you know, so everyone plays a very key role and an important component to the process. Um, Segwaying next, how do you find your investors? So, you know, you're obviously unique because you have the background of your sales, but would you say typically speaking, it's mostly folks that have been in your organic uh, you know, network over, you know, the course of your sales career over, you mentioned two decades, is it mostly people that you've met along the way? Uh, it likely had to be friends, families, sphere of influence there, but has it kind of transformed over time now into, you know, more organic referrals and lead generation and magnets throughout the systems you've implemented? Be curious to know, how have you been able to do that? Because you've raised a significant amount of capital in a very condensed period of time. Yeah, no, it, it's it's a great question. So really, it did originally start out with people that I knew were relatively close to me, people that I already know, they know, like, and trust me, you know, they've got capital sitting on the sidelines to invest, right? That's obviously important, you know, in this space, I don't want to take somebody's last $50,000 they've got, you know, on the sidelines, right? So it goes back to the qualifying questions, folks, make sure you ask them and, you know, make sure that they know the risks associated because not everything goes to plan from time to time. Sorry for interrupting, but Nope, that you're you're exactly right. So that was really kind of how it first started with me is just making, you know, a couple dozen phone calls, letting people know what I was up to. By that point, they already had a general idea because I was already putting myself out there on LinkedIn and Instagram and just kind of, you know, planting some of those seeds, so to speak, right? So made a couple of dozen phone calls, got some people committed to the deal, raised a million bucks. Great. Okay. That was about the hardest that I worked. Okay, to generate leads. Since then, it's literally just been continuing to put myself out there and being consistent, you know, with messaging on LinkedIn, on Instagram. We, you know, started a podcast about a year ago now. So I'm just like you, where I'm bringing guests on to provide value to my listening audience, right? You know, it's establishing a drip marketing campaign, right? So that as people come into the funnel, right? You know, I am able to drip market to them, you know, a series of 30 emails over a period of, you know, four or five months, right? But what's really set the business on fire has been what has occurred in the last six months. And that is investor referrals, okay? So the reality is, is when we raise capital on a new investment offering, we'll bring anywhere from 20 to 50 new investors into those opportunities with an average commitment of between 50, you know, and a hundred thousand dollars, right? The reality is the majority of those investors have not even known me for more than six months. Okay. Like these are net new investors that were referred to me by someone else that has already been able to vouch, you know, for me, you know, from a credibility perspective has already been able to endorse, you know, what we're doing at starting point capital. I have so many conversations today with investors that literally tell me I am investing in your next deal, even though I haven't heard it because so-and-so told me they invest with you. Okay. Yeah. And that is the power of, you know, with great powers come great responsibility. And it just, you know, it's so crucial to make sure that, you know, although we can get success, you know, just like we unfortunately walked away from a deal in Dallas, just like you've probably done before. Sometimes, you know, you want to do something and things change and you got to make sure you stick to your guns and, you know, stick to what's ethical by you. And that just obviously a testament to your success and your ethics to have people to refer to you that, you know, blindly trust you. And that's really when you take yourself out of, you know, just another, you know, commodity space into a legitimate and real brand. And that's the ultimate goal is not becoming a commodity, not being a commodity anymore, not being just a turnstile of people using you, but people that want to grow with you, want to have your insights into their offerings and into their life. That's the most special thing that you can do. And I'm sure a lot of these people become buddies and friends, which is the beautiful, beautiful thing about the business. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And it's, it's really, um, it's really a tremendous fiduciary responsibility as well. 
almost a bit of a weight, you know, on my shoulders because, you know, not only am I putting my own personal capital, you know, into these opportunities, but I'm also helping others deploy their hard earned capital into these opportunities as well. So when you heard me unpack the six T's earlier, you got to have that right. You have got in this space, you have got to align yourself with the best in class sponsors that know what they're doing, you know, have that track record, have that team, because again, more so than anything, you're not investing in the property. You're not investing in the market. Okay. You're not investing in the IRR or equity multiple projection on the pitch deck. You are investing in that operator, their ability to execute that value add business plan. If it's a value add opportunity, that's who you are investing in. You are investing in people. Okay. You're not investing into a building. I love that. Well said. With that said, segueing to just the final kind of wrap up questions here. What assets do you think will do best coming up with the cycle kind of where we are currently? Well, I wish I had a crystal ball and I wish I could find my magic eight ball, but it seems to be missing. Right. So <laughs> unfortunately, I don't know that I would want to lead with what I think an asset class could be because certainly, you know, mobile home parks have been popular, RV parks, car washes, you know, pickleball facilities. I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of different, you know, things out there that you can, can syndicate. And I'm not saying that any of those are going to perform negatively or positively, but one of the things for me specifically is I, I would call myself a relatively uh, conservative investor. And I have, I, you can't argue with the fact that everybody needs a place to live, right? Certainly people can double up. Okay. Certainly that type of things, things can happen, right? You know, maybe interest rates do start to come down and it becomes more affordable for people to move into, you know, single family homes, or maybe, you know, companies like Boxable that are out there that are trying to, you know, accelerate the production of single family homes, you know, on an assembly line, the same way that they manufacture cars, you know, maybe something like that could solve the single family, you know, affordability crisis that we have in America, right? But apartments are always going to be there, right? And so I just personally, when it comes to my kind of own risk reward, you know, tolerance level, my risk profile, right? You know, I am very bullish on the multifamily space. Absolutely. And then with that said, on the other end of the spectrum, what do you think will struggle most coming up? Uh, anything that people consider to be the, the shiny, the shiny new object, right? And that very well could be one of the things that I've already highlighted before I gave my endorsement to, to multifamily. So I guess I would just caution investors to be diversified, right? To stay educated um, on the strategy. Um, you know, I've made some higher tolerance for risk investments and some different angel round investments at the family and friends level. You know, I make those investments with the attitude of they're probably going to be a donation, okay? But if they're not a donation, right, um, then that opportunity is going to literally go to the moon, right? Um, I personally think that everybody needs to assess their own personal risk tolerance level. And the reality is, is that's different when you're in your 20s than it is in your 40s or 50s, right? It just is, right? And so, you know, stayed diversified uh, would be my kind of, uh, you know, overarching feedback. Right. With that said... So two sides of the coin here, what's getting you most nervous and excited with the changing market and recession likely looming? Although, as we know, you know, we'll believe it when we see it, because in 2017, as you mentioned, there's a little micro recession, rates went up and got cut. Um, very uh, smart and spot on that you do, in fact, remember that very few people do actually, in fact, recall that little blip in time. Uh, but with that said, what is getting you uh, excited and nervous about what we both probably likely think is going to be a micro or some sort of recession coming up? Well, if you're asking me what my hot take is, okay, I'm going to tell you right now because it goes in with the hot take. Let's yeah. lead with it. Fire away. <laughs> I love Sounds this. Sounds good. Yeah. So I have a uh, a love, I feel like interest rates are kind of this Jekyll and this Hyde. I have this love-hate relationship with where interest rates are at right now. I, I want interest rates to go down, okay, because that will allow for my valuations on the 29 investments that I'm in to likely go up, right? There's that direct correlation between interest rates and cap rates and valuations, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. right? Uh, see Rob if you want to know more, all right? Yeah. So there's that side of the struggle bus that I'm having, right? 
There's also some investments that I made personally in 2021 that had floating rate bridge debt. Those are coming due in 2024. You know, whether the sponsor has suspended distributions or has a capital call, some of those things are yet to be determined, right? So I, of course, I want interest rates to come down to protect the sponsor, right? And to protect my investment. The side that I struggle with on the other side of the fence is that my purchasing power, my net worth as an investor continues to deteriorate every single year because of the inflation monster, okay? So I remember when I was a kid, Craig, when I was a kid, it was like, if you had a million dollars, you were rich and you could retire. You were that guy. Yeah, by the time I got into college, it was like, well, the needle's now been moved. It's probably more like 2 million at this point, right? And then I get into my 40s and it's like, if I wanna maintain the same lifestyle that I have today, right? And I wanna continue to invest in passive cash flowing real estate investments, like that's just not gonna be enough, right? And that needle continues to get moved because of the inflation monster. There's a reason why when my wife goes to the grocery store and buys a, you know, a, a dozen eggs, why did she just spend $8 on a dozen eggs when three years ago you could have got it for three and a half bucks? Um, I had this discussion with my 17 year old teenager the other day. I said, when I was a kid and I'm not endorsing McDonald's here, I don't personally like McDonald's, but when I was a kid, you could get a value meal with two cheeseburgers a large fry and a large pop for $2.99. I asked my 17 year old, okay, this is now 30 years later. How much does that number two cost today? He says, dad, it's eight and a half bucks. Okay. So my point being is that our purchasing power and our net worth continues to deteriorate every year as a direct result of inflation. So we should all want inflation to go down. Okay. And as inflation goes down, traditionally, interest rates tend to go up because they're largely trying to suppress uh, the consumer from spending, right? But also the government needs to be held in check as well, because most people think that inflation is caused by interest rates. It's not. It's caused by both government and consumer spending. And until those two things start to diminish or decrease, Inflation is always going to be there. So yes, I want lower interest rates on the one hand for my real estate investments, but on the other hand, I want inflation to be t- tampered down as well. I love that. Jeremy, we could probably talk all day long, but unfortunately, I know you're a busy guy. I'm going to have to let you go. But for the audience and everyone listening, you just provide so much great value. If they want to find your, you know, your, uh, your philosophies and ways to reach out to you, your principles to invest and to partner with people, how can people find, reach out to you and get a hold of you if they want to invest with you or just you know, find out more about you and connect? Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. So you're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm just under Jeremy Dyer, um, as well as you can check out our website at startingpointcapital.com. Again, that's startingpointcapital.com. Awesome. Well, everyone, make sure to reach out to him. He's one of the biggest stars in the business right now. I have no doubt you hit the $100 million equity raise point very soon. For everyone listening to the show, thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. Peace.